T-minus 21 seconds, and the solid uh, rocket booster engine gimbal now underway. T-minus 15 seconds. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. The Space Shuttle Challenger disaster on January 28, 1986, remains one of the darkest moments in the history of American space exploration. Millions of people, including countless school children, watched live as the shuttle broke apart just 73 seconds after launch, killing all seven astronauts aboard. The tragedy not only brought the U.S. space program to a standstill, but also left behind haunting questions about what exactly happened to the crew in their final moments and how their remains were ultimately handled. The Breakup and Crew Cabin Separation so the 25th space shuttle mission is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning, it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. When Challenger disintegrated high above the Atlantic, the orbiter's crew cabin broke away largely intact. Engineers later determined that the crew compartment, made of reinforced aluminum, survived the immediate explosion and continued on a ballistic arc for nearly three minutes. During this time, it rose to an altitude of 65,000 feet before beginning its descent back toward the ocean. Although the breakup looked instantly fatal to viewers on the ground, evidence suggests the crew may have survived the initial structural failure of the shuttle. Investigations into the accident found that several personal egress air packs, or PEAPs, had been activated by at least three astronauts, including pilot Michael J. Smith. Since Smith's switch was located on the back of his seat, it had to have been activated by another crew member, indicating that some astronauts were conscious after the breakup. This revelation suggested that at least part of the crew remained alive and possibly aware during the terrifying fall. Investigators also discovered switches in the cockpit that had been moved manually, reinforcing the possibility that Smith and others attempted to restore power in the aftermath of the shuttle's destruction. NASA officials could never say with certainty exactly when the astronauts died. Some experts argued they likely lost consciousness due to the depressurization within seconds. Others maintained that some or all may have remained alive until impact. The cabin itself did not catastrophically rupture in the breakup, meaning pressurization loss may not have been immediate. The final moments, then, remain among the most tragic mysteries of the disaster as the crew faced a hopeless situation in which survival was impossible. The impact with the Atlantic Ocean was devastating. Traveling at approximately 207 miles per hour, the crew compartment slammed into the surface with a force estimated at 200 times the pull of gravity. This extreme deceleration far exceeded the structural limits of both the shuttle and human survivability. So even if the crew had survived the breakup, the violence of the ocean impact ensured no chance of survival. The recovery operation. We're awaiting word there holding their breath just, I'm sure, as everyone else is. You saw it just a few moments ago, about 45 seconds after liftoff, a huge fireball in the sky. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. What was happening to the crew at this moment? They were still alive. Challenge is fast. Launch is fast. It's bang, and then it's a two-minute ride down, and you're conscious, we know that. Astronaut Story Musgrave told me the crew survived in that white cloud. It was Challenger's fuel tank that exploded. The shuttle itself just broke apart. The crew compartment with its seven living occupants was intact. Following the disaster, NASA and the U.S. military launched an extensive search and recovery mission in the waters off the coast of Florida. Initially, recovery teams focused on retrieving floating debris from the orbiter and its external components. But within days, the operation expanded to include a massive underwater search. Dozens of ships, aircraft, submarines, and divers participated in scouring nearly 500 square nautical miles of the Atlantic. On March 7, 1986, more than a month after the disaster, divers from the USS Preserver located large sections of the Challenger crew's compartment on the ocean floor. This discovery confirmed the worst fears. The astronauts' remains were inside, 
The wreckage lay at depths of around 100 feet to 200 feet, and recovery required both technical divers and remotely operated vehicles to carefully raise pieces of the cabin. The operation was delicate and shrouded in secrecy, with NASA stressing the need for dignity and security as the bodies of the astronauts were located. By April, much of the crew cabin had been recovered, along with the remains of all seven astronauts. Notably, Gregory Jarvis's body was temporarily separated during the recovery effort when it floated away from the wreckage, but divers eventually recovered his remains on April 15th. Officials were careful not to release graphic details to the public, though investigators privately noted that the remains were severely fragmented and unrecognizable as human bodies due to the violent impact and subsequent submersion. The recovery of the Challenger crew was one of the most sensitive and somber operations ever undertaken by NASA. The astronauts were national heroes, and every measure was taken to ensure their remains were treated with the highest level of respect. Once recovered, they were transported under military escort to Patrick Air Force Base, where pathologists began the difficult work of identification. Identification and Handling of the Remains could have lost consciousness at that altitude if it depressurized for a little while, but then, no, there's all kinds of evidence that you died when you hit the water. Once the Challenger crew's remains were recovered, they were taken to Patrick Air Force Base Hospital near Cape Canaveral. There, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology performed examinations to identify each crew member. Given the conditions of the remains, the process was complicated and took weeks to complete. Despite the best efforts of medical examiners, exact causes of death for each astronaut could not be determined. The impact with the ocean had been so violent, it masked evidence of whether decompression or lack of oxygen had caused death beforehand. NASA initially released a statement confirming the recovery, but declined to go into detail. Officials explained that out of respect for the families, they would not describe the condition of the remains or the specifics of the autopsy findings. The New York Times reported at the time that the remains, quote, could not be recognized as human, a description that underscored the trauma of the accident. Families were notified privately, and NASA held the line that certain details were simply too painful and unnecessary to share publicly. There was also a legal dispute surrounding the handling of the remains. Local medical examiners in Brevard County argued that they should have jurisdiction in conducting the autopsy and issuing death certificates. NASA, however, insisted on handling the process through the military to ensure both security and uniformity. Ultimately, NASA released the official death certificates, bringing closure from a legal standpoint. Funeral Ceremonies and Arlington Internment In late April 1986, the remains of the Challenger crew were formally transferred aboard a military transport aircraft from Kennedy Space Center to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. Each casket was draped in the American flag and escorted by honor guards, with astronauts accompanying the procession in a solemn tribute. It was one of the most dignified ceremonies ever conducted by NASA, underscoring the national grief surrounding the disaster. Francis R. Dick Scobie, the commander of the mission, and pilot Michael J. Smith were both laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery. Their graves remain places of quiet reflection for visitors to this day. Ellison Onizuka was buried in Honolulu at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, while Ronald McNair was laid to rest in South Carolina. Judith Resnick's remains were cremated and her ashes scattered at sea. Krista McAuliffe, the beloved teacher chosen for NASA's Teacher in Space program, was buried in her hometown of Concord, New Hampshire. Gregory Jarvis, too, was cremated, and his ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean. There was also a collective internment. Because some remains could not be conclusively identified or were co-mingled during recovery, NASA arranged for a group burial at Arlington National Cemetery. Section 46, Grave 1129, became the final resting place for the co-mingled remains of the Challenger astronauts. The site includes a memorial featuring the famous poem High Flight, a verse often associated with aviators and astronauts. The Arlington Memorial ensured that the Challenger crew would be remembered not just individually, but also as a team who gave their lives together in pursuit of exploration. Legacy and Memorialization Why not leave the past buried? Some would say this opens a wound all over again. I don't think it opens a wound. Uh, you know, it's our history. It says who we are as a nation, uh, that we don't let adversity stop us.
In the years following, the Challenger crew has been honored through countless tributes, memorials, and educational initiatives. The most prominent is the Challenger Memorial at Arlington National Cemetery, but it's far from the only one. The Space Mirror Memorial at the Kennedy Space Center, a striking black granite wall that reflects the sky, bears the names of the Challenger astronauts alongside those of other fallen spacefarers. Schools, streets, and public buildings across the U.S. have been named in their honor. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you think NASA was right to keep so many details about the crew's remains private? Let us know in the comments section below.